So you've decided that Unify is the right solution for your business or home, but you're not a network engineer and you wanna make sure that there isn't gonna be any security vulnerabilities. And you also wanna take full advantage of all of the functionality of a business grade system. Well, this is the video for you. We're gonna talk about everything from basic terminology all the way to more advanced features like VLANs and IPS and show you how to set everything up to best practice just the way we would do it if you were to hire us as a consultant. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. Now, should you require more hands-on support, not only can we help you spec out your system and deploy it, we can also manage and support your entire Unify ecosystem. Pricing for this is down in the video description. Now, before we get into our initial configuration, we need to discuss terminology, specifically the different types of devices that you're going to be working with. Now, if you've been shopping for Unify equipment, you've probably seen things like gateways, consoles, switches, access points, and you may not be exactly sure what you need. And frankly, it can be confusing because very often one piece of hardware can serve multiple functions. Well, let's break it down. A gateway is a device that sits at the edge of your network. It connects your local area network to the broader internet. And very often a gateway can have other functions. It can be a wireless access point. It can also be a switch. It could be a modem. And in most cases with Unify, it's gonna be a console, but we'll break those other terms down next. The next term is switch. A switch is a device that lets us plug in various devices, whether it be printers, phones, computers, cameras, other networking equipment such as switches, gateways, wireless access points, door access control systems, IoT devices. You get the idea. If it uses an RJ45 or an ethernet cable and it plugs into that device, well, that device is a switch. And most of the Unify gateways are also switches. Actually, most gateways are also switches. But when we say switch in the networking world, we're typically referring to a standalone device that is strictly a switch. Now the term wireless access point should be pretty simple. That is a wireless radio that broadcasts Wi-Fi. And in general, just like with switching in the networking world, when we say Wi-Fi access point, we generally are referring to a standalone device that's sole purpose is to broadcast Wi-Fi, not a device that has a number of different functionality. Now the last term we're gonna cover that's somewhat unique to Ubiquiti is console. Now, what is a console? Well, you don't actually need a console to configure your network. That's true. You can remote into every single networking device via SSH and configure it, but that's not exactly very intuitive. Although it is what we do in larger networks and it's what we used to do for all networks years ago. And this is what makes Unify really Unify. And that's the ease of configuration via a console. Now, in most cases, your gateway is going to be your console, such as the Dream Machine Pro, the Dream Machine Pro SE, the Dream Router, the Unify Express, all of these are examples of gateways that are consoles as well. Now there are a couple different types of firewalls from Ubiquiti, or gateways rather, that are not going to include a console built into them. This includes the Gateway Lite, the Gateway Pro, and any of the older USG models. You will need a standalone console to administer these networks easily. A good example of a standalone console is this. This is a Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus, and in addition to helping you administer the network via the network application, you can also run Protect, Talk, Access, Connect, and any other apps Ubiquiti may come out with in the future. Now, if you're planning on deploying a network that's gonna have hundreds or thousands of Unify devices, this guy's not gonna cut it. You're gonna to wanna to take a look at the Cloud Key Enterprise. Finally, you can also deploy the network control software via Windows or Mac OS, or even on a Linux server. But in general, I don't recommend this approach because it requires more maintenance and there's nothing like the feeling of knowing that you're gonna to have to reconfigure your entire network from the ground up because you forgot to do a backup and your computer had some sort of malfunction. In general, Unify consoles are gonna be far more reliable for administering your network than anything you're going to self-host. As with most things in life, our journey begins with a gateway. In this case, the Dream Machine Pro. Now we're gonna to wanna to plug our internet into the WAN port on the UDM, but before we do that, we're gonna to wanna to remove any other networking equipment. After all, we want this to be the gateway of our network. Now in most cases, you may need to go into your modem and set it to bridge mode. This is going to ensure that your modem is not also functioning as a gateway. This can create a situation called a double NAT, and it's generally not a good thing to have on your network. If you have any questions, you should contact your provider because in some cases they'll have to enable bridge mode 
for you. Now let's proceed with plugging in our computer into one of the LAN ports on the UDM. And from there, we're gonna open up our web browser and we're gonna head on over to the IP address of the UDM. In this case, it's gonna be 192.168.1.1. Now we can name our device. I think this would be a great deployment for a coffee shop, so let's go with something cool. Now something I wanna point out very quickly is that if you are replacing a failed piece of equipment or upgrading, you can actually restore from a backup right here. Let's go ahead and proceed though. And we can either create or log into an existing Ubiquiti account. Now if you're deploying this for an organization, a bit of housekeeping that I recommend is creating a standalone IT account for the organization, such as IT at your domain. Com. In our case, we're going to go ahead and sign in with our Ubiquity account. Now, because I've signed in with my Ubiquity account, it's giving me the option to restore from a backup from one of my other consoles. Because we're going to set this up as a brand new site, we're going to go ahead and click Continue Without Backup. At this point, I recommend you go get a cup of coffee as setting up Unify OS and updating the console can take up to 20 minutes. Setup is complete. Now we can go ahead and log in. Normally, if you see this alert on the internet, you should steer clear, but it's just telling us that the certificate used to encrypt our traffic between our computer and the console is self-signed, and it hasn't been verified by a third party. But in this case, we know that the UDM Pro is trustworthy, so let's go ahead and proceed anyway. Now we're going to log in with our Ubiquity account, the same account we used earlier. Awesome, now that we're logged into Unify OS, we can actually start plugging devices directly into the ethernet ports on the UDM and start using the internet. This is something that kind of separates Unify from other vendors out there. And that's that you could basically plug in a switch and start using it immediately without any configuration. Of course, there's a lot of benefits to configuring things and that's what we're gonna do next. Let's go ahead and open up the network application right here. And then we're gonna head on over to devices. You can see right here, we have our UDM Pro. Let's go ahead and plug it in our 24 port PoE switch. Awesome, there's our 24 port switch. I'm gonna go ahead and click this button to adopt it. And while that's happening, I'm gonna get our access point ready. In this case, we are gonna be utilizing the U7 Pro. This is an awesome access point for a number of reasons. A big one is that in addition to the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands, this uses six gigahertz. So it's definitely gonna future-proof our network in terms of performance. Looks like our switch has finished adopting. Now we just need to wait for our access point to finish booting so we can adopt it. If you're not planning on using more than eight ports, by the way, you're better off getting the UDM Pro SE rather than a standalone switch since you could plug your access point directly into the ethernet ports on the UDM itself. And there's our access point. I'm gonna go ahead and adopt it. If you're worried about running out of space on your switch, one tip is to use a direct attached copper cable like this one. These are great because you can use the SFP ports on your equipment. And if your equipment is SFP plus equipped, you can get faster speeds at 10 gigabits per second. These generally cost about $20 on Amazon and they come in different colors and lengths. I have ones we use linked down in the description below with all the color options. But it looks like our U7 access point has been adopted. So now we're gonna move on to our next chapter and that is going to be virtual networks. In order to understand how amazing virtual local area networks are or VLANs, we first need to understand what we did before we had VLANs. Back in the long ago, in the era of 2005, 2006, if you wanted to have a separate network for your guest or a separate network for your servers, you had to physically deploy separate equipment and isolate it physically. Virtual networks and virtual local area networks specifically is a technology that allows us to do this well virtually. And that's what we're going to configure. Now, since we aren't limited by the cost of physical equipment, we can have as many as we want. And depending on your use case, you may have more or less than what I'm going to configure. Here's what we're going to set up. And this is the scheme that we do for most of our clients. We're gonna set up a core network. The core network is specifically and only for networking equipment. It's the, what the UDM itself is gonna sit on, the access point, the switch, and any other servers we may get in the future. The second network we're going to configure is a staff network or a people network. This is going to be for our employees at our pretend coffee shop. The next network we're going to configure, and it's an optional one, and that is a VoIP network. Now, separating your VoIP traffic is good for a number of reasons, 
but sometimes we may not want to do it, especially if we are doing pass through on our phones. A lot of VoIP phones, you know, they will plug into the wall and the computer will plug into the VoIP phone. And if we're using soft phones, then we're not gonna worry about it, but we're gonna configure it for the purposes of this guide. The next network that we're going to configure is going to be a security network. This will be for our security cameras, our door access control system, and anything that's related to building security. Then we'll configure an IoT network. This will be specifically optimized for IoT devices. And a big reason of segregating this traffic is we don't always trust all of our IoT devices, and many of them have been known to scan our network and send that telemetry back to the company that made the product. And that company could be in China. So we're gonna separate that traffic. Now the last network we're gonna configure is the guest network. But as I said earlier, your network is gonna look different than this one, or it might look the same. We've done a lot of deployments where we've had less VLANs or more VLANs, depending on your use case. So let's begin with configuring the core network. To configure our networks, we're gonna click on the gear icon in the bottom left, and then we're gonna to go to networks. Here, you can see we have one default network already, and this is actually going to be our core network. However, we're gonna change the scheme. Currently, it is a class C. We're gonna move it to a class A, specifically 1069. Now, that second octet, that two, or actually one to three digit number, can be whatever you want. Pick a number that's meaningful to you. We are big fans of the space program and Apollo, and the year that we went to the moon was 69. So that's why all of our networks begin with that second octet of 69. We're gonna go ahead and click into it. And one thing you'll notice is we can't rename it. This is a limitation of the newer version of Unify OS. So we're gonna to go to system down here, advanced, and we're gonna switch back to the legacy interface just for a second. We're gonna go back to settings, networks, default, and we're just gonna call this core network. We're gonna save this. We're gonna go back to user interface, and we're gonna switch back to the new user interface. Now we're gonna go back to the gear, networks, and we can see this network has been named core network. Now we're gonna change the IP scheme. And something to note here, Whenever we change an IP scheme of a network, all of the devices on that network may not automatically request a new IP address because they're still gonna remember the lease that they had before we change the IP address. The easiest way to fix this is either to power cycle those devices or unplug them and plug them back in. Let's go ahead and change this from an automatic scale network. And we're gonna do that 10.69.1.1 and we're gonna do a slash 24. For all of our networks, we're actually gonna do a slash 24. And this is going to allow us to have in the neighborhood of 200 devices. If you're gonna have more than that, then you wanna do a bigger subnet, which is actually a lower number. Let's go ahead and scroll down here and talk about these options. Now, content filtering is pretty cool, but here it is very aggressive. And if we hover over work, you can see that YouTube is set to safe mode. Google is set to safe mode, which Google being in the safe mode is fine. Uh, however, YouTube can be pretty aggressive and family is even more aggressive. So we're gonna leave that alone, but we are still going to do DNS filtering. Specifically, we're gonna use Cloudflare's porn and malware blocker. Now this is a great solution because it blocks those types of content, but it's also not overly aggressive. And then we can have more aggressive forms of filtering if we want to, and I'll show you how to do that later on. Next, we're gonna change our DHCP range. Because this is the core network, we're gonna be setting static IPs for all of our equipment. So I like to start this at 100, and that way I have the first 100 addresses for routing and switching equipment. And then for the back end, I'm gonna stop it at 199, because I like to use 200 and above for my access points. Next, we're gonna go ahead and click on Show More Options. And then we're gonna change DNS from Auto, and we're gonna manually enter our DNS servers. Now don't add any other DNS servers here because if you do, you will disable the filtering. We're not gonna change the least time, but we are gonna enter in a domain name. We don't actually have to since we're not on a Windows AD network, but we're gonna do it for fun. All right, that's great. And by the way, the .local TLD is reserved for local network use. So you can set anything you want to be .local and that will work locally on your network. And if we head back over to Unify Devices, you can see that our UDM Pro is getting ready and that means it is provisioning. However, if I hit refresh here, nothing's happening, it's not refreshing. And the reason for that is the IP address of our UDM has changed. 
It is now no longer 192.168.11. It is instead 10.6911. And I actually probably won't be able to go to it because my computer still has an address in that class C, that 192 address. So does the access point and the switch. The easiest way to fix this is just to unplug these devices and plug them back in because then they will request a new DHCP lease. Let's start with my computer. Awesome, now let's head over to that new address. And we will need to re-authenticate because we are in a new session. Now we're gonna click on network again. We'll go to unified devices. And you can see here our switch is getting ready and our access point is still offline because I've power cycled it. Looks like everything's readapted with a new IP address in our class A, but since we're on the topic of the core network, let's go ahead and assign static IPs to these other devices. We'll start with the switch. I'm gonna go to settings. And then we're gonna change IP settings from DHCP to static. Now, if you mess this up, you will actually lock yourself out of the switch, but don't worry, you can actually just reset your switch with a paperclip and then it will pull up again with a DHCP address and you can try again. And if you do that, don't feel bad, I've done it a number of times. The IP address, we're gonna do 10.69.1.2. For the DNS, we're gonna use the same thing that we used before. Now, since our network is a slash 24, our subnet mask is gonna be 255.255.255.0. And then our gateway is the IP address of our gateway, which is 10.69.1.1. Now I always recommend giving this a read over just to make sure we enter it in everything correctly. But let's go ahead and apply these changes and we'll move on to our access point. We're gonna click on settings and then we're gonna scroll down and we're gonna change IP settings to static. Same thing, except this time we're gonna use the address 200 for the fourth octet because I like to put the access points on the tail end of the scheme. As I said earlier, I recommend giving this a read over to confirm everything, but let's go ahead and apply changes. Awesome, looks like that did take successfully. Now we can move on to creating our other networks. Next is the staff network. We're gonna to go to the settings icon, networks, and we're gonna create a new virtual network. We're gonna call this staff network. We are gonna disable auto scale and we're gonna type in our scheme 10.69.2.1. This will also be a slash 24 and we're gonna change advanced to manual. Now something we see here that was not present on our core network and that is a VLAN ID. You see the core network isn't a VLAN, it's just a regular LAN. And this being a VLAN, it needs a VLAN ID. This really is only gonna be useful if you are connecting Ubiquiti gear to other non-unified gear, which you can do by the way. If you wanna use VLANs though, you will need to manually go into that equipment and specify the VLANs you're gonna be using for every single port on your switch or wireless access point. We're also gonna leave multicast enabled. For those of you wondering, what is multicast? Well, if you've ever gone to use an Apple TV and seen it pop up right on your phone or use AirPrint, you've probably wondered, how did my phone find that device without me entering in an IP address or a domain name or just any other information? And the answer is multicast, more specifically Baljour. But Baljour is a multicast protocol. Basically the Apple TV or AirPrint printer just says, hey everybody, I'm here. Hey everybody, I'm here. And that's great, especially on small networks, but we typically disable this or at least enable some controls on larger networks to keep things from uh, getting too crowded on the network. But in our case, we're gonna leave this enabled on every network except our guest network. We can also leave the DHCP range as it is and we're gonna change one more setting in here, and that's DNS. We're gonna set that to the same DNS server as we did before. I will also change the domain name. And let's click Add. Next, we're going to create our VoIP network. For this scheme, we're gonna do 106931 slash 24, and we're gonna do the exact same settings we did before. Now we're gonna create our security network. This will be 10.69.4.1 slash 24. And we're gonna use the same settings. Next, we're gonna make our IoT or our building network. For this, we're gonna do 10.6.9.5.1 and it will also be a slash 24. And we're gonna use the same settings as we did for all of our networks. Finally, we're going to create our guest network. And the settings here are gonna be very similar with one exception. We do 10.69.6.1. Just like before, we're gonna change this to manual, VLAN ID of six, that's fine. And we are going to enable network isolation. 
This is just one of the layers of security we're going to apply to keep our guest traffic separate from all of our other networks. We're also going to disable multicast. And the DHCP range is fine to be left alone. Finally, we're gonna go down under show more and we are gonna change the DNS settings and manually add those same DNS servers we added earlier. It's not required, but you can also add a .local domain to the network. That looks good. Let's go ahead and click add. And there are our VLANs. We have a core network, a staff network, a VoIP, security, IoT, and a guest network. But we're not done with the network configuration. We're also going to go ahead and disable IPv6. Now, the savvy among you probably have noticed that with the exception of the guest network, I didn't create any additional firewall rules. So this means that technically a device on the IoT network could talk to a device on the staff network. So are we going to create these rules? Well, the answer is no. You see, we're already doing more than most organizations do by separating our traffic into VLANs and a device on one network would need to know the IP address of that device on the other network in order to communicate. Even in that case, that traffic is gonna go over our gateway, so it is gonna be sniffed by intrusion prevention, and we're gonna set that up later. Now, you absolutely can go and configure these rules, and it is best practice, but for the purposes of a beginner tutorial, I don't recommend setting up those rules, especially if you are a beginner. Now, we're gonna go ahead and head on over to our Unify Devices section, and we are going to set up the ports on this switch for the appropriate network. So we're gonna click on our switch here, and we're gonna go into Port Manager. All right, I've got everything selected. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and click on Core Network, and we're gonna change this to Staff Network. Now, I don't have anything plugged into these ports, but should I plug in, for example, my computer, into one of them. We're gonna get an IP address that looks like this. And you can see by that third octet, the two, we are on the staff network. Now that we have set up all of our virtual networks and configured our network switch, we're going to move on to the next chapter, Wi-Fi. To get to the Wi-Fi settings, we're gonna go ahead and click on the gear icon here, and then we're gonna to go to Wi-Fi. Here we're gonna create our staff network and I'm gonna call it Florida Coffee Staff and we're gonna to need to choose a password. I recommend anything longer than 12 characters. Because this is a Wi-Fi network password, I'm gonna use a passphrase as opposed to a password, which is easier to remember and type in. This next section right here is very important, and it's where we're gonna choose what virtual network our Wi-Fi network is going to use. In this case, we're gonna go ahead and choose that staff network. The next setting here, we're gonna choose which access points we wanna broadcast this network on. This is great if you have certain Wi-Fi networks that you only want to be broadcasted in certain parts of your facility. In our case, we only have one AP, which is why we have the only option there. Under advanced, we're gonna switch it to manual. And then here is where we can set a couple different things. First is our hotspot portal. I'll show you how to configure this later because we're gonna use it on the guest network. And we also have the option of which bands our Wi-Fi is going to broadcast on. You will notice because we have a Wi-Fi 7 access point, we have a new option, six gigahertz. Let's go ahead and enable that. We can also hide the Wi-Fi name. Now what this does is it's not going to broadcast the network name. So if someone wants to join it, they're gonna to have to go to other in their device settings and type in the network name. I generally recommend this for staff and IoT networks. So let's go ahead and enable that. Client device isolation is not something we're gonna have on the staff network, but we will use it on our guest network. Fast roaming is something we generally enable. Wi-Fi speed limit is not necessary. Multicast environment, again, we wanna make sure we enable this if we're planning on using anything that uses Bonjour or a multicast protocol such as AirPrint or AirPlay. For security protocol, we're gonna choose WPA3, but you may notice these other options are grayed out, and that's because we opted to use six gigahertz. Now, six gigahertz is an awesome Wi-Fi band, but it is a newer technology, so it doesn't support WPA2. These are just different security protocols, and what you need to know is just the higher number means more secure. We're not using WPA1 at all. Two has kind of been the standard for a number of years, but there are some security vulnerabilities that we know about. And so three is the most secure Wi-Fi authentication method that we know of. And most devices now coming out now should support WPA3, but you're gonna find a couple devices that simply don't work with it and require WPA2, especially on the IoT side of things. And that's probably because IoT devices are notorious for having security vulnerabilities and different issues, but that's why we created a separate VLAN for IoT. But on this network, we're gonna use WPA3. That said, if you have any issues connecting devices, this is the first thing I would check. The second thing I would check is disabling 
hiding your Wi-Fi network from being broadcast. Next, we're gonna go ahead and create our IoT network. Let's go ahead and click Create New. For the name, I'm just gonna call it IoT. Remember, we're gonna be typing this in on devices that may not have great keyboards like thermostats or other devices. So we wanna keep things as short as we can. For a password, we're gonna choose a 12 character passcode that doesn't use symbols as some IoT devices actually have issues with symbols, which is weird, but it happens. Now for the network, we're of course gonna choose IoT. We're gonna to change to advanced. And here, this might vary depending on your use case. Some IoT devices don't work well if there's a five gigahertz Wi-Fi band being broadcasted. So we can disable that and strictly have it be a two gigahertz band. I also like to hide these networks since they're kind of service-based networks. I don't want people to see them. And then if we scroll down to the bottom here, we're gonna choose WPA2 for the network. And we definitely wanna make sure that we enable multicast on this network. One option you can configure on this network is client device isolation. If your IoT devices only need to talk to the internet and not to each other, tick this box. Now we'll add that network as well. Lastly, we're gonna go ahead and create our guest network and then we're gonna set up the captive portal for it. For this, I'm just gonna call it Florida Coffee. Now for guest networks, I like to keep this clean and simple. Remember, both the staff and the IoT networks are hidden, so this is the only network our guests are going to see. Now, if you're planning on using a captive portal, we don't wanna put a password in here, as that means users are gonna to have to enter a password in twice, once when they click on the network, and then again when they are prompted to enter the password in the captive portal. If you are not planning on running a captive portal and you wanna keep your guest network password protected, then you should enter a password here. Of course, we need to switch our network to guest, and then we're gonna to toggle on advanced settings. If we want to use a captive portal, we'll enable hotspot portal, Captive portal is technically a Cisco term, but it's become the industry standard term. Unify likes to refer to this as a hotspot portal. Either one works. Now we can enable the six gigahertz band here, but if we do so, we will not be able to utilize WPA2. So if you're not planning on utilizing a captive portal and you wanna use WPA2 to allow more devices to join, make sure you do not enable Wi-Fi 6, but since we're using the captive portal and we're not gonna have any password here on the WPA side, we're gonna leave that enabled. We obviously don't wanna hide the Wi-Fi name, but we are gonna enable client device isolation. What this does is it prevents a device on the guest network from talking not just to other networks, but to other devices on the same network. This is really good because it's a common attack vector uh, used by malicious actors, especially in our coffee shop. We don't want someone coming in there, setting up a laptop and uh, committing malicious acts on our other customers in the shop. So very important we enable this functionality for our guest network. We can go ahead and enable fast roaming and we will enable a Wi-Fi speed limit. So let's go ahead and create a new Wi-Fi speed limit profile. We'll call it guest. And this part's gonna vary depending upon your internet connection. You can always start it off high and lower it. Uh, we'll go with 50 by 20 and we'll add it. And you can see we have now added a Wi-Fi speed limit profile. So we'll head back to Wi-Fi. Now a quick note on the Wi-Fi speed limit, this is going to be per guest, not for the entire network. So make sure you set that limit, taking into account that that is gonna be the per device speed limit. Let's go ahead and select that profile. And then we're gonna make sure that multicast is disabled since this is a guest network after all. And then for security, once again, because we are using that captive portal, we're gonna leave this set to open. And if we want to, we can set up a Wi-Fi schedule. This is really good if you're in a place that is well, public, because uh, it's not uncommon for folks to come out to your parking lot and torrent movies, and depending on your provider, you can get into trouble with that. It's also good just to keep people from loitering. So if this is a problem, here's your solution. But we're gonna pretend that our fictitious coffee shop operates 24 seven, so we'll keep that disabled. And then we're gonna go ahead and add this Wi-Fi network. And there you have it, there are our three wireless networks. We have a network dedicated to our staff, our IoT devices, and our guests. Now, we can absolutely set up Wi-Fi tuning for each specific access point, but that's a little bit more complicated and the AI technology has gotten better and better and better. So you're better off in most cases just clicking the Optimize Now button and letting it rip optimizing your Wi-Fi. Now, we're not quite done with the Wi-Fi setup. We have one more step to do if you wanna utilize the captive portal. Remember, we just need to make sure that we tick that hotspot button when we're in the guest Wi-Fi settings, but to configure it, we're gonna go over to the hotspot configuration tool. To do this, we're gonna to go to the hotspot manager, and then we're gonna click on a landing page. 
Now this is pretty customizable. We can change the background, the colors, the logo. I'm gonna go ahead and find some good photos online on Unsplash and grab an icon from the internet. There we go. I think that looks pretty good for our captive portal. I'm gonna go ahead and save those changes, but I wanna show you some of the other options we have in here. Under authentication, if we want to have a password, we can do so simply by ticking the box and entering in our password. We can also charge for payment. Uh, this does require some additional integration and I'm not gonna go into it in this video, but this is a great solution if you're running some sort of hotel service and you wanna charge for different speeds of wireless. We can also issue vouchers. This is a really great solution for that same use case, but you maybe wanna use your existing payment system or you're charging at the time of booking or you want them to be able to come to the front counter, pay for a service, and you give them a voucher to get online rather than doing all of it through the portal itself. All right, let's go ahead and test our captive portal. There we go. Let's enter our password and we're in. I'm gonna run a speed test just to make sure our speed limit is working. Well, the results are in and our speed limit is working. Now we have one more step we can do to optimize our Wi-Fi performance and that's gonna be modifying the AP broadcast settings. Now, as I said earlier, when it comes to picking specific channels to broadcast on, in most cases, you're gonna be better off leaving this to auto. But there is a setting we can modify to give us a little bit more performance out of our APs. And there are some exceptions to this, so your mileage may vary, but in nine out of 10 situations, what I'm gonna show you will improve your wireless performance. To do so, we're gonna head on over to the Wi-Fi access point. We're gonna click on settings. And then we're gonna come down here and change the transmit power from auto to high. And we're gonna do the same thing for all bands. Now you can also modify the channel width, but this is gonna have two caveats. Number one, not all devices support higher bandwidth channels. And if you live in an area with crowded frequency space, actually this could hurt performance, not help it. But if you're in a very remote area and you're managing all of your own access points manually and you're keeping them separated, this can add performance. But in general, you're better off just setting the transmit power to high and leaving these defaults as they are, unless you know what you're doing. But I'm gonna go ahead and click apply changes. And with that, we are done. This concludes the Wi-Fi chapter. Next, we're gonna talk about security. Now, before we begin, I wanted to debunk a common misconception when it comes to network security. Good network security is not a replacement for other forms of security, such as device security, data security, cloud security. Rather, it's just a different layer of security. Now, it is true that network security matters far less than it did 10 years ago, and that may come as a shock. It's not that it doesn't matter, it still does, and in some ways it matters more. But we're no longer, in most cases, sending our data unencrypted. We're using HTTPS for pretty much everything on the internet. Now, there's still a great amount of data people can get from monitoring network traffic, such as what websites you're visiting, how much your time you're spending on a particular site, how much data are you transmitting, and you can actually tell a lot from that, more than you would otherwise think is possible, trust me. But with that said, we still want to enable best practice security, and it starts with good password security. We recommend 12 characters or more. Why 12 characters? Well, 12 characters seems to be the number right now that's pretty hard to break unless you have access to a large amount of computational resources or you want to spend a lot of money with AWS. Now, this is going to be true for your Wi-Fi password as well, and most importantly, your Unify account password. Make sure this is a password that is unique. Don't just add a number to your existing password. And if you're not currently, use a password manager. I recommend 1Password or Dashlane. I've used them all. 1Pass is my favorite. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's actually dive into Unify and begin optimizing our security for this network. To get to security, we're going to go to the gear. And then we're going to go to security. Now, here we have a couple options. Let's go over them. The first is device identification. This is pretty cool. Essentially, what it does is it uses the MAC address of a device to determine what the manufacturer and model of that device is. It's not perfect, but it works for most common devices. Anything in the Apple ecosystem, Dell, HP, you know, Unify, Nest, if it's a common manufacturer, it's gonna show up here. It's pretty cool tech. We can also enable or disable traffic identification. Now, this means that we're gonna be able to determine what websites our clients are visiting. 
And this is why network security is important because if we don't have good security in place, anyone on our network may have the ability to do this. Obviously not to the degree that we're gonna have in Unify, but they could still monitor this data. Country restrictions. I definitely recommend enabling this. And it's not foolproof as getting around it is as simple as using a VPN, but it is an additional layer of security that is good. Now, I don't recommend you go crazy with this because you're gonna learn very quickly how far your traffic might go to get to a particular website, even if it's not in a country that you think it's in. What countries do I recommend blocking? As of the recording of this video, these ones. Now, ad blocking is pretty cool, but it is very aggressive. Not because it's gonna block other things, it only blocks ads. But what you don't realize is that the first few results in a Google search is just ads. And while you are probably a tech savvy user, most users are not, and you're gonna get emails very quickly complaining that the internet is down when you're just blocking ads. So enable this option with caution. The next option is DNS Shield. Now this is new tech and it's pretty cool. See, one of the challenges with using the internet is that at the end of the day, you don't know where a website is, so you have to ask an index, in this case a DNS server, hey, where is google.com? And it's gonna tell you the actual address or IP address of google.com. The problem is that your ISP or whoever you're getting your DNS request from can tell what you're looking up when you query a DNS, and this is a way to mitigate against that. Now you are kind of moving the problem to the provider, so hopefully you trust the DNS provider that you're using, but this is an additional layer of security that's pretty cool if you wanna play with it. We're starting to enable them on some deployments, but it is a new tech, so again, be cautious. Now let's talk about honeypotting. The internal honeypot is a feature that will let us essentially set a trap for the bad guys. So if you want, you can set one up on your various networks and if any malicious computers try to, I don't know, take advantage of the honeypot, we'll get a notification. I actually have not seen this used in the wild, but we generally try to secure our networks so it doesn't surprise me that we haven't seen this be triggered. Now under suspicious activity, this is what we call IPS or IDS, and it stands for Intrusion Detection System and Intrusion Prevention System. What's the difference? Well, IDS is simply going to detect and notify us of a potential intrusion, whereas IPS will take action. Now in most networks that we're running, such as PFSense or Palo Alto, we're typically running IDS but the Unify IPS is actually good enough that we just run IPS, as I've actually never seen it give a false flag, at least not in the last year or two. So we're gonna enable this and tick all of the options. We're also going to apply this to all of our networks, although we don't have to if we wanted to apply it to one specific network. We're gonna set this to notify and block. This would be IPS versus IDS, and then we're gonna set it to high. Of course, we can go in here and customize the categories if we want to, but since we're running a UDM Pro, we have more than enough horsepower in order to filter for all of these options. We also are gonna go ahead and block the dark web and block known malicious IPs. This is a good additional layer of security in addition to our cloud flare filtering that we're doing through DNS we set up earlier in the virtual networks chapter. This is gonna utilize Unify's custom list of known malicious IPs. Now I wanna say something real quick. I think they have done a great job of giving us ready to go out of the box solutions, especially for smaller networks because we need to remember, we're not gonna have full-time IT administrators in most cases administering these small networks. And so having a set of tools that we can just turn on and know are not gonna give us false positives is really good. And it's why we turn most of this on, actually all of this on with few exceptions for all of our deployments. Now let's go ahead and apply our changes and provision this. But this is gonna conclude our security chapter. Next, we're gonna tackle VPNs. This chapter is optional, but if you wanna take advantage of the VPN functionality within Unify, we're gonna cover the different types of VPNs that we can configure, and I'm gonna show you how to configure two of them. Now, I wanna debunk a myth about using a VPN, and that's that using a VPN just makes you more secure. And while it can, the reality is when we use a VPN, we're just moving the burden of information from one provider to another provider. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't trust any US-based VPN company. I would use something like Proton VPN or Molvad VPN. Now, what are the types of VPNs in Unify? Well, the first type is going to be a VPN server. This is us configuring our Unify gateway as a VPN server. So if I have a device like an iPhone or a MacBook and I'm traveling abroad, whether in the US or even internationally, I can tunnel back into my network and access resources, be it servers, or just make the internet think that I'm still in my office at home. 
Now we can configure these with a couple different flavors of protocols and I'll show you that in a second. The second type is going to be a VPN client. This is where our unified gateway is acting as the client and it is connecting out to another VPN service. Now we actually have a video on this where we use Mulvad VPN to make our entire network appear as though it was in New Zealand. Now there is a pretty cool use case for this. A lot of social media, whether it be TikTok or Meta, just is not secure and they are doing a lot of data collecting. So what you can do is create a route in Unify to send any social media traffic out over that VPN so those services think you're in a different city than you are. Pretty cool way to make your network more secure and it anonymizes traffic because it's different from the rest of our traffic on our network, which is just gonna go right out the regular WAN. Now the last type of VPN is going to be a site-to-site -site VPN. And this is something that is very unique and pretty cool and unified. This is where if we have multiple locations, we can actually connect them together to make them appear as one network. It's kind of like getting a spool of ethernet and running it from one location all the way across town to the other location. So if we have a server, be it a Synology server that's running an SMB file share, well, folks at the other location can access those resources just as if they were on the actual physical network. It's pretty cool and it relates to a new technology that Ubiquity has called SD-WAN. SD-WAN is a phenomenal technology and under the hood it does utilize a VPN, but we'll cover that in a later video. Now let's go ahead and get into configuring our VPN. And to do that, we're gonna click on the gear icon and then VPN. Now you may notice we have four tabs here and that's because the first tab is for teleport. This is Unify's custom flavor of VPN. And what it allows us to do is give folks access to our network via a VPN just by sharing a link. They just need to install the Wi-Fi Man app. Now what's pretty cool about this is we can actually use it for remote deployments of Unify Talk phones. So if you wanna give someone a Unify Talk phone for their home office, well, they can actually connect back to your network using Teleport, it's pretty cool. But we're gonna talk more about the VPN server because for most of you that are configuring VPNs, this is probably what you're gonna be using. And the other two types, we can cover in different videos. Now, when we talk about configuring our UDM Pro to be a VPN server, one of the most common questions we get is, which VPN protocol should I use? WireGuard, OpenVPN, or L2TP? And the answer is, it depends. Now, in our view, WireGuard is simply the best, fastest, and lowest latency VPN protocol, and our testing shows that. And OpenVPN is not close behind. But there's a reason why a lot of you are gonna opt for L2TP, and that is compatibility. You see, my iPhone out of the box supports L2TP. No third-party apps required. And that's the one I'm gonna show you how to configure in this video because for most of you, you can simply input these credentials into any computer and you'll be able to VPN back into your main network. So to do that, we're gonna head on over to L2TP. And then here, we can give it a friendly name. Let's just call it L2TP Coffee. And then we have a pre-populated, pre-shared key. This is a shared key that everyone who needs to use our VPN service will need and we'll wanna share that with them. Next, we're gonna choose a public IP address that we can use for our VPN server. Now, most of you are just gonna have one, and in my case, you can actually see this is an internal IP address, and the reason for that is this is a lab environment, and I actually have it sitting behind another firewall. If you do see an internal IP address, most likely your modem is not in bridge mode, and you wanna remedy that, as otherwise your VPN is not going to work. Down here, we can create new users, and you can see I already have a test user, so I'm gonna go ahead and create a new user. Let's call it uh, test2. Now best practice is to create a unique username and password for each individual that's gonna be accessing the VPN. Under advanced, we're gonna select manual. We're gonna leave radius profile on default, and we are gonna set up a different range in the default variables. In our case, we're gonna do 10.69.200.1. Now as you may have noticed, this is outside the range of any of our existing VLANs, and this is done intentionally. It's best practice to have our VLAN network be separate than the rest of our traffic. And if we know the IP of other devices, we can still talk them, precluding any firewall rules that would block that. Finally, we're gonna require strong authentication, and we can go ahead and add this VPN configuration. Now I'm gonna show you how I would connect my Mac to this VPN server. First, we're gonna to go to System Settings. Then we're gonna to go to VPN. We're gonna click Add VPN Configuration and choose L2TP. Now we just need to fill in the details. The first thing we can do is give it a friendly name. For configuration, we're gonna leave this at default, and then we're gonna to need to enter our server address. This is gonna be this server address found right here. Then for our account name, we're gonna enter our username. In this case, we're gonna do test2. User authentication is gonna be password, and we're gonna enter in our password. 
which is going to be right here. Machine authentication is going to be our shared secret, and we can copy that right from here. And that's it. We just need to click Create, and then to connect, we're going to toggle right here. That's it. You just configured a VPN server, and because you're using your hardware and your internet connection, there are zero monthly fees to keep this going. And we covered a lot of ground in today's video, and that's because you guys requested a comprehensive beginner's guide to configure Unify. So we've made this video for you. We'd like to know what other videos would you like to see? Perhaps more advanced features in Unify that we could explore, or other technologies as they relate to IT? Let us know down in the comments below. Now we make these videos for free for your enjoyment, so if you are planning on purchasing some Unify gear, we'd really appreciate it if you could use our affiliate link down in the description. It doesn't change your price, but it certainly helps us out here. And if you are looking to hire someone for IT consulting, we would really appreciate your consideration. Well, that's all we have for today. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. Until we meet again, bye for now.